Chapter 18, last chapter, the 101th Dalmatian. <clears throat> Christmas Day at the house in Regent's Park was absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> the rather good hotels sent plenty more steaks, and though there were not, of course, enough presents to go round, the pups were able to play with lots of things in the house which were not intended to be played with, but were played with ever afterwards. The dailies took all the pups into the snowy park, Pongo, Mrs. and Perdita, circling round to make sure none got lost. <clears throat> and at twilight, Pongo and Mrs. firmly led the dailies up to the top of Primrose Hill, embarked over a dogdom-wide network. They even managed to get a message through to the gallant old Spaniel, for two dogs from a village five miles from him made a special trip in order to bark to him. <clears throat> he sent back a message that he and his dear old pet were very well. Of course, the dogdom-wide barking was relayed. The farthest away dog Pungo and Mrs. spoke to direct was the Brigadier General Great Dane over towards Hampstead who was in great barking form. There is something very mysterious about this barking at twilight, said Mrs. Dearly. <clears throat> Do you think they are sending messages? Mr. Dearly said it was a charming idea, but, and then he stopped. Was anything beyond dogs? Not when he thought of all Pongo and Mrs. had done, how they had got 97 pups back from Suffolk. Pongo and Mrs. longed to tell him, but they, but they never could. As soon as Christmas was over, Mr. Dilly decided to act quickly, for he realized that 100 Dalmatians were too much for one house in Regent's Park. They were even a bit much for Regent's Park. First, he advertised, in case any of the rightful owners of pups wanted to claim them. But none did. For this reason, Cruella had bought all the pups except those stolen from the dearlies. Because it costs a lot to get any expert stealing done these days, Cruella had paid more to the dog thieves who stole from the dearlies than for any litter she had bought. And naturally, people who had sold puppies never thought of them as lost, or did anything more about them. Only one owner turned up, the farmer who had owned Perdita, and he was quite happy to sell her to the dearlies. So there was Mr. Dearly, lucky man, with one hundred delightful Dalmatians, he decided he must take a large country house. Happily, he could afford this, as the government had again gotten, got itself into debt, and he had again got it out. And this time, he had been rewarded by an income to save his income tax on. So he had retired from business, except for being always ready to help the government with its sums. One fine day in January... When the snow was all gone, he said to Mrs. Dearly, Let's drive out to Suffolk and return the little blue cart to Master Tommy Tompkins, and also hunt for a country house. And we'll have a look at the house where the puppies were imprisoned. Not that we'll take that one. <laughs> Mrs. Dearly laughed at such an idea. They took Pongo and Mrs. with them, and Lucky came as a stowaway, under a seat because he wanted to see the sheepdog again and be made a captain. He didn't stay under the seat long, and everyone was delighted to see him when he came out. When they reached Dimpling, they went for a walk round the village and met Tommy Tompkins out with the sheepdog. So the little blue cart was returned then and there, rather a relief to the dearlies 
who wouldn't quite have known what to say to Tommy's parents. They didn't have to say anything to Tommy, as he still wasn't quite talking. Though his chuckling noises were at last beginning to sound more like human than dog. The dearly saw at once that Pongo, Mrs. and Lucky knew the sheepdog, and the tabby cat that came hurrying up. And now we'll find Cruella's house said Mr. Daly. When they got to Hell Hall, there was a large notice outside, saying, For sale. Cheap. Owner gone to warm climate. And the gates stood wide open. The house was empty. The Baden brothers were now in jail for assaulting the man who came to take away the television, who had never been which had never been paid for. They weren't minding jail much, because meeting so many criminals was almost better than television. And they now had high hopes of one day appearing on What's My Crime? What a hideous house, said Mrs. Daly. What a lovely wall, said Mr. Daly. One thing had been worrying him, if he took a hundred Dalmatians into the country, how was he to prevent them from running wild? This magnificent wall was just the thing. If only the house were not so hideous. <clears throat> Suppose it was painted white, he said, and the blocked up windows were put back. There's a lovely pond in front, almost a lake. Mrs. Daly shook her head. But when they got into the house and saw the fine large rooms and imagined them all white instead of red, she began to feel different. Pungo, Mrs. and Lucky raced through the kitchen and larder, remembering all that had happened there. The Dalys followed them and saw the furnace for the central heating. Then they all went out to the stables. These would make fine kennels if they were heated, said Mr. Dearly. Then he looked up and saw the folly, and both he and Mrs. Dearly took a fancy to it, and they decided then and there to buy Hell Hall and make it into a beautiful house. Here, we will found a dynasty of Dalmatians, said Mr. Dearly. Mrs. was insulted. She thought the word meant a nasty din. But Pongo explained that it meant a family that goes on and on. Mr. Dearly added, And we'd better start a dynasty of Dearlies to look after the dynasty of Dalmatians. And Mrs. Dearly quite agreed. The alterations to Hill Hall were quickly made, and one sunny day in early spring, a removal van and an extra-large double-decker motor coach stood outside the house in Regent's Park. The van was for the furniture. The coach was for the Dearlies and the Dalmatians. The nannies had already gone down by the car to open Hell Hall, Nanny Butler driving. She had a smart chauffeur's cap to her butler's outfit. Mr. Dearly came out of the house with Pongo and Mrs. Mrs. Dearly followed with Perdita, and with the white cat on her shoulder. The white cat, too, was to start a dynasty at Hell Hall. The Dearlies had promised her a white Persian husband. Within the next few minutes, two surprising things happened. First, just as Mrs. saw the removal vet and said, Oh, there's a miracle. A Staffordshire terrier flung itself from the van and said, here we are again, to Pongo and Mrs., and hurled itself at Mr. Dearly's chest. That's a compliment, if you only knew it, said Jim, who was standing by the van. That's right, said Bill. Old battering ram's fallen for you. <laughs> and I for him, said Mr. Dearly politely, rising from a sitting position. Pongo and Mrs. managed to quite 
to Quayton, the Stratfordshire, before he paid any compliments to Mrs. Dearly. And then the second surprising thing happened. A large car had drawn up, and the people in it were looking at Pongo, Mrs. and Perdita, with interest. Suddenly, there was a wild commotion in the car, and then the door burst open and out sprang a superb liver-spotted Dalmatian. He dashed up to Perdita. It was her long-lost husband. His name was Prince. The people in the big car were much touched by his faithfulness to Perdita and at once offered him to the dearlies, saying they would be glad of a good home for him as they were always going abroad and having to leave him in kennels. Prince was delighted. Apart from wanting to be with Perdita, he knew good pets when he saw them. So the Dalmatians started for Suffolk, one hundred and one strong. They all sat up on the motor coach seats, looking out of the windows, and many people who saw them pass cheered, for there had been much for there had been so much about them in the papers that they were now quite famous, and many, many dogs lined the route, as word of the journey had gone out by twilight barking. The waiting dogs barked their good wishes, and the Dalmatians barked their thanks so it was rather noisy in the motor coach. The dearlies didn't mind. They thought happy barking was a pleasant noise. Prince was rather shy at first, so Mr. Dearly sat beside him and punched him in a way some big dogs like to be punched. The punching needs to be hard enough, but not too hard. It must please not hurt. Mr. Dearly was a highly skilled dog puncher. Prince thumped his tail, then suddenly gave Mr. Dearly's ear a playful nip, which was much appreciated. After that, Perdita's has handsome husband felt he was completely one of the family. When the Dalmatians reached the village of Dimpling, all the villagers were out to receive them with the sheepdog, the tabby cat, and Tommy Tompkins well to the fore. The cows were lowing a loving welcome from the farm. Tommy had his little blue cart with him, and the cat pig felt just a bit envious, but she was happy to know she had grown too strong to need any cart. The white Persian cat, who was now a charming creature, kindness makes kind cats, was extremely gracious to the farmyard tabby. It was the beginning of a firm friendship. At last, the motor co coach drove in through the wide open gates of Hell Hall. The pond now reflected a snow white house with muslin curtains at all the windows. The front of the house still seemed like a face and had an expression, but now it was a pleasant expression. The nannies were waiting at the open front door. As they came to meet the dearlies, Nanny Butler said, Do you know there is a television aerial on the roof of this house? And Nanny Cook said, Seems wasteful not to make use of it. Then Mr. Dilly knew that the nannies wished for television in the kitchen, and he at once suggested it. Pongo and Mrs. were delighted, for they knew how mu very much their smallest daughter had missed it. But during the many happy hours, the cat pig was to sit watching it in the warm kitchen. She never liked it quite so much as that other television, that still silent television she had seen on Christmas Eve, when the puppies had rested so peacefully in the strange lofty building. She often remembered that building and wondered who owned it. Someone very kind, she was sure, for in front of every one of the many seats there had been a little carpet-eared puppy-sized dog bed. The End